We're going to welcome Bishop Gordon Wong to our pulpit this morning. Let's put our hands together to welcome him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and good morning. I bring you greetings from your sister churches, in Singa- Methodist churches in Singapore. Don't worry, I'm sure they'll get it up in a while. Uh, so greetings. Do, do you know how many sisters you have in Singapore, Methodist churches? Anybody know? Anyway, there are 46 Methodist churches in Singapore, so you have 45 sisters. But also greetings to those of you who are in Bark Road Methodist Church, but you're, uh, you're at the sanctuary, so greetings to you as well. I want to thank Pastor Wendy and the the leadership for this opportunity to to share with you in your weekend services here at Barker Road. We, of course, are not just a Methodist church. We join in with brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the world. And so today, particularly Sunday, throughout the world, millions of people will gather, just like we gather today, to remind ourselves that God is our creator, and the one who loves us and sent his son Jesus to die for our sins. And we gather to give him worship and praise. When uh, the pastoral team invited me to speak this weekend, they they said I could choose any passage, any topic that I wanted. Uh, And so I thought about what your pastors have been leading us in, in a, a recent sermon series. And a recent sermon series, I hope you remember it, was called the Connect experience. And the Connect Experience sermon series was given that heading that your soul may prosper. And so I thought I would develop that theme or or continue that theme of our souls prospering. And so I've chosen a very short psalm for our scripture reading. We heard that passage read for us a few moments ago from Psalm 131, where the psalmist describes finding calm and quietness for her soul. Now, I know that, well, actually, I'm not sure whether those of you at the sanctuary have already done what the 8.30 a.m. have what they call a prayer for illumination, where we pray for God's Holy Spirit to guide us as we read God's Word and reflect on God's Word. But over here, we just read the Scripture, so let me lead us in a short prayer that God may speak to us from this portion of His written Word. Our Father, we thank you that the gift of your written word is so freely available to us here in Singapore. Now as we consider these few verses from your written word, we pray for your Holy Spirit to speak to us, to be our true teacher. And may the greater glory of Jesus, your Son, always be our supreme concern. We pray in his name. Amen. Do any of you have Irish friends? Move in, Irish friends, oh great. I'm sure those of you who have, you know how they're a lovely bunch of people. They're very friendly and they of course love to joke and they love to joke about themselves, pretending that they are very silly. So for instance, my Irish friend will say, I'm not late, I'm on Irish time. And so here's a picture of an Irish clock an Irish clock where the hands and the hours go in a different or in an anti-clockwise direction. And I'm sure you've been blessed with Irish jokes. My friend Desi came up to me and said, Gordon, have you heard about our Irish parachute? We're very proud of it. It's fully automatic. It opens automatically on impact. But of course, though they pretend to be silly, in reality, they aren't. Desi was one of our top students in Bible college. Anyone who can laugh at themselves is a wise person indeed. And although I've forgotten many of their silly jokes, I still remember an old Irish blessing that I think isn't silly at all. It goes like this. May you have the hindsight to know where you have been, the foresight to know where you are going and the insight to know when you are going too far. The writer of Psalm 131 would have said, Amen. My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things that are too wonderful for me. The psalmist makes a deliberate, a conscious effort 
to step back, to refrain from being involved in things that are too great or too wonderful for her. She has the insight to know when she is going too far. Now, hold on, Gordon. Are you you sure that attitude is a good thing? It it sounds like an excuse to quit, a cop out from overcoming difficulties and hardships. Never mind how difficult something is, surely we must always push forward to try and overcome that difficulty. The concern of the objection is fair, but it misunderstands what the psalmist is saying. The psalmist is not speaking against hard work or against perseverance. Notice what the verse says. My heart is not proud. My eyes are not haughty. The psalm does not criticize hard work or perseverance. It cautions us against haughtiness and pride. Let me tell you another Irish joke, but I'll edit it to include a Singaporean. There was a Frenchman, a Singaporean, and a proud Irishman, and they were sentenced to death by guillotine. The Frenchman's head is put on the block. The lever is pulled, but nothing happens. The guillotine does not fall. Mon Dieu, cries the Frenchman, God has saved me. The miracle is taken as a sign from God that the Frenchman should be pardoned. Next, the Singaporean's head is put on the block. The lever is pulled, but again, nothing happens. Hosea, since you let the Frenchman go, you must also let me go, otherwise not fair. And so the Singaporean is released and pardoned. Finally, the proud Irishman is led up to the guillotine. He is an engineer, and as he is escorted to the chopping block, he looks at the lever's mechanism and he proudly says, wait, wait, I see what's wrong. Let me fix it for you. Psalm 131 is not against progress. It's not against self-improvement. It is warning us against pride. Pride that leads to our self-destruction. Sometimes we see that something is wrong and we drive ourselves to fix it at all costs. And in so doing, we bring the guillotine down on ourselves. Our relentless pursuit of what we believe is the right thing to do can sometimes blind us to our pride. And we may end up bringing destruction, not just upon ourselves, but upon our families and those under our employ. This is what Psalm 131 says warns us against. The psalmist knows that pride can seduce us into getting involved in some matters that are too great and too grand for us. We bite off more than we should chew. And if we keep on chewing, we end up choking, choking ourselves and choking those around us. There is an important difference between healthy aspiration and harmful ambition. Pride blinds us from seeing any distinction between the two. Yes, it is good to aspire to be the best that we can be. Yes, there is value in pushing oneself and reaching for the stars. But too much pushing And what is good will turn bad. What is healthy will turn harmful. Take water. Water is good for us, even essential for daily living. But too much water and we will drown. I wonder how much of the destructive stress and tension that we experience in life comes from pushing ourselves too far, from accepting projects and promotions which are too much for us. 
And then we end up struggling every day just to try and keep afloat. Is it worth it? And even if we do manage to keep afloat or manage to succeed, what has been the opportunity cost of that success? What toll has it wreaked upon us and upon those around us? Was it worth it? Our Lord Jesus asked us to think, what does it profit a person if he should gain the whole world but forfeit his soul? Psalm 131 seeks to save us from forfeiting the health of our souls in the relentless pursuit of too much. If you open your Bibles, there is actually a superscript that is attached in the printed versions. When we read the text on uh, PowerPoint, we don't normally show this superscript. But these notes at the start of the psalm draw our attention to David. These notes provide clues as to the way the psalm might be profitably applied. Some of our translations translate it as of David, which is a possible translation, but the Hebrew, right, the Hebrew words can just as correctly be translated as for David or something dedicated to David. In any case, the person who added these introductory notes draws our attention to David. What would an Israelite reader think of when he thinks of David? What do you think of? Over here in the Shine Forth service, we sang a song that mentioned David. I think of David and Goliath. The story of a young man who brought down the Philistine giant against all the odds. And after such a triumph... Who would have blamed David for thinking that nothing would ever be impossible for him to achieve? And yet Psalm 131 suggests that this psalm is relevant for this David. Indeed, perhaps the psalm is most relevant for people like David, mighty King David. People who, like David, achieve great success in the past. They are people who most need to beware of going too far and trying to do too much in the future. Why? Because Goliath conquering Davids almost always end up becoming King Davids. And if you are a King David, or a Chairman John, or a President Mary, then the danger of you trying to go too far is compounded for other people. The mighty Davids of this world, they cannot conceive of anything as going too far. It's not in their vocabulary. And so they press forward relentlessly, relentlessly, on and on. But King David does not do it alone. When King David's press forward, everyone under his authority and employment is forced to press on and on and forward also. When healthy aspiration becomes harmful ambition, it isn't only King David himself who might be harmed. Stress and strain is placed upon everyone in the kingdom, everyone in the company, or the church, or the family. Everyone is asked to strain forward. Is this the way to achieve greater success, greater progress and prosperity? Perhaps, but only if King David does not go too far. If he goes too far and does not have the insight to know that he is going too far, then we will create a world where people are under the constant tyranny of stress and strain. And our souls will become sick and sad. Or as someone succinctly put it, busyness may feed our egos, but it will starve our souls. Are any of us here 
King David's or Queen Dorothy's. We have been blessed with gifts and talents, with drive and determination that have made us become successful leaders. Please, pray for the wisdom given to us in Psalm 131. Pray against any pride that will blind us from seeing when our healthy aspirations are turning into harmful ambitions. Pray for the humility to weigh our ambitions, not just in the light of what we think that we can do, but in the light of what our children or our colleagues should or should not be required to do. How? How can we be saved from the pride that pushes our own agenda too far? In a world where success is equated with ambition and achievement, how can anyone escape the swirling currents of busyness that sweeps us into ever deeper waters? Verse 2 tells us what the psalmist did. Surely I have calmed and composed my soul like a weaned child resting on its mother. Is that a good description or picture of your life today? Or would your life be more accurately described today as a child who is throwing tantrums, demanding a sweet or more computer time? A restless, crying child? Or a resting and contented child? Which would you rather be? The psalmist says, I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. We should note that in Psalm 131, it does not say like a baby resting on its mother. It describes a weaned child. This is important. The picture of a weaned child guards against two common misunderstandings of Christian faith. Some people picture the Christian's relationship to God as that of a newborn baby to its mother. Now, the baby depends completely upon its mother for virtually everything. The baby does nothing to keep itself alive. The baby just eats, sleeps, and cries. The baby demands milk from its mummy's breast every few hours. The newborn baby says, when I'm hungry, I will cry and keep crying until someone feeds me. The picture of a baby speaks of our total dependence upon God. And such dependence upon God is a good and important thing to do, to have. The danger with that picture, however, is that we may end up thinking that we don't have to do anything for ourselves. And we end up doing too little for ourselves. Like a baby, we simply lie back, lie flat, wait for our next feed. I don't have time to work hard and study and read. God will do it for me. He will preach and prepare the sermon for me. I don't need to make the effort to go and see a doctor. God will heal me. I don't need to make an effort to heal or help my neighbors and love them. God will love them. God will help them. My only responsibility is to pray, pray, and cry like a baby whenever I feel hungry or dirty. This kind of infantile dependency on God produces Christians who do too little and try too little to do what is good and right. There is an opposite mistake, and this is when we try to do too much. The contrasting picture views the Christian's relation to God in terms of an adult child. The adult child no longer depends on his aging parents for food or money or housing. In fact, it is the adult child's responsibility now to look after his aging parents. She needs to help Father God manage world affairs and the environment. Or Mother God depends on us now to bring the gospel to the whole world. 
We should not expect God to help us, nor wait for God to do so. As adult children, it is now our responsibility to do things for our aging Father God. No. Psalm 131 does not picture our relationship to God as that of an adult child to an aging parent. Nor does it choose the image of a newborn baby crying all the time. No. The picture is that of a weaned child. This is a child who no longer needs direct feeding from his mother's breast, no longer cries every three hours for a feed. For ancient Hebrews, the child was weaned at about three or four years old. By then, the child has learned to be sustained on food that does not come directly from the body of his mother. God is not simply a newborn baby's feeding machine. At the same time, however, the weaned child is still very much a child. Yes, he takes on a measure of independence. Yes, he learns to use his own hands to do things, to bring food to his mouth. He learns to go to the toilet on his own. He's able to walk longer distances without having to be carried. He's able to speak and able to understand much more than as, than as a baby. Yes, but he is still a child. And there are still some things that this child should not do and should not even try to do. He should not at this stage try to handle boiling water or, or, or take a chopper and chop the vegetables. No, he is not to cross a busy highway on his own. He is not yet an adult who is ready to leave the shelter of the family home. The wean child still needs his parents' protection. The child is becoming mature enough, mature enough to trust in his mother, mature enough to express his love for his parents in different ways. But he does not for one moment imagine that he can do without them. The wean child does not and should not try to do too much. This is the picture of Christian faith presented to us in Psalm 131. A relationship of dependence and trust as that of a weaned child resting quietly on its mother. The wise Christian will do neither too little nor too much. Now, it's not easy to find this balance, is it? The psalmist didn't find that balance easy either. Verse 2 begins in the original Hebrew with a very strong phrase. English translators uh, differ on how to translate it. One translation simply uses the word, but, but I have composed. Another uses, surely, surely I have composed. Yet another one uses no exclamation mark, I will compose. These are different ways to convey the same thing. Namely, that the psalmist is making a very strong and determined pledge, a determined effort to try and be quiet, to step back from certain things, to be composed. It was not something that came naturally or very easily to the psalmist. She had to make a determined effort to step back, to compose, and give rest to her soul. And in verse 3, the psalmist invites others, invites the whole nation, invites the church, invites us all to do the same. Israel, put your trust, put your hope in the Lord, both now and always. This is the secret of contentment and peace. Put your hope in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. This is how we can find rest for our souls. Listen to the Lord Jesus himself, who in the Newer Testament says to us, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn. From me. I am gentle and humble in heart, 
and you will find rest for your souls. The famous Baptist preacher, Charles Spurgeon, said, Psalm 131 takes only a few seconds to read, but a lifetime to learn. Its wisdom is appreciated by most people only in the twilight years of their lives. When we are young, it is so difficult to avoid the harmful ambition that seduces us into ventures that stretch us too far. When we are trying to establish our careers, it is so difficult to step back, to compose our souls, and even ask the question whether we are pursuing too much. But friends, this morning, we are here, seated quietly in the house of God, resting in the loving arms of God. And so before we head back into the busyness of the rat race next week, let us take time, at least today, to rest and to be composed, to make an effort to rest and be composed and to find rest by putting our hope in God, by resting like a child on its mother's breast. May God, may God grant us all the hindsight to know where we have been, the foresight to know where we are going, and the insight to know when we are going too far. Let us pray. And as you take some time to pray, let me just sing an old song, I think it was by B.J. Thomas, that reminds us of the importance of being still and letting God love us. I need to be still and let God love me I need to be still And let God love me When this old world Starts to push and shove me I need to be still And let God love me I need to relax and let God take over. I need to relax and let God take over. He'll take this load off my shoulder. I need to relax and let God take over when there's trouble all around me and my soul cries out for rest when i feel like i'm failing even though i've done my best when decisions get so heavy and there are answers that i need I know it's time to just be still and let God love me. I need to be still and let God love me. I need to be still and let God love me. When this old world starts to push and shove me I need to be still And let God love me Father, help us to be still To compose our souls to rest our souls and find strength and peace from you. 
We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.